we will now look more in depth at chemical formulas, the ways in which those atoms are bonded to each other, and then how to name those compounds. You will see chemical formulas communicated in a bunch of different ways. The first is with something called a molecular formula, which is just a list of element symbols and their subscripts. So this is an example where you will see that subscript on the right side used to indicate how many atoms of each element are there. So for N2, which was our example before, there are two nitrogens. CH4 is a molecular formula for a compound that has one carbon and four hydrogens. And C2H4O2 has two carbons, four hydrogens, and two oxygens in that molecule. You will also see structural formulas. Now, this will come up not too much in this class. Eventually, you will put together some simple structural formulas, but I may give you a structural formula for things that are a little more complicated where I'm asking you to apply something, but I, I don't need you to come up with the connectivity all on your own. So structural formulas give you the same information as the molecular formula, plus they show how the atoms are connected. So this is important because C2H4O2 could be acetic acid or methyl formate two different compounds, just a different arrangement of the same number of each type of atom. So in acetic acid, if you kind of look at this from left to right, we have a carbon that's attached to three hydrogens. That carbon is also attached to another carbon. The carbon on the right has a double bond to an oxygen, a single bond to an oxygen, and then that oxygen is connected to a hydrogen. We'll go way more in depth about the double bond versus single bond, but just so you know what the number of lines means. In methyl formate, we do start with a carbon with three hydrogens on the left, but now that carbon is connected to an oxygen instead of another carbon, and then the carbon on the right, it still has a double bond to an oxygen, but then it is connected directly to a hydrogen. I'm gonna break out the elements and compounds a little bit more. So if you remember from our table in module one, we had pure substances broken down into elements and compounds. Now within elements, I, can, I finally am able to give you a little more information. So we had helium as an example of an element. Helium would be an example of an atomic element. So it means it exists as a single atom. Neon is another example of this. So when you have a, a sample of just helium or just neon, it is a bunch of individual atoms of helium or neon. Elements can also exist as molecules. So oxygen is an example. Elemental oxygen exists as O2, which is two oxygen atoms connected to each other. Sulfur, as an element, exists as eight sulfur atoms connected to each other. In phosphorus, it's P4, so four phosphorus atoms connected to each other. This is just how you would find it. If you had a sample of elemental oxygen, it would be a bunch of O2 molecules in that sample. Now, there is uh, a set of elements that are found as diatomics. You should know this list. Um, there are a bunch of different acronyms out there to help you remember this list. The one that I was taught is Brinkelhoff, which is just a funny sounding word that is made up of these elements in a specific order too. So if you can spell it, you can write the elements out. So that would be bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, where they all exist as diatomics. So it's Br2, I2, N2, Cl2, H2, O2, and F2. In the compound section, 
you can have compounds that are molecular or ionic. And so this is where we're gonna get into different types of bonds. And the only reason that it's important is that it determines the rules we use for naming. So molecular compounds of which water, H2O is an example, are held together with covalent bonds and ionic compounds of which sodium chloride is an example, are held together with ionic bonds. So all atoms, if they are connected to something else, it is held together by some type of chemical bond. The source of that bond is that they are either sharing electrons or transferring electrons. And that is the difference between covalent and ionic. Covalent is sharing electrons, ionic is transferring electrons. And let's look at some better examples and a more in-depth definition. An ionic bond occurs when you have a metal and a non-metal. So when you look at the periodic table, the things on the left side are metals, and you'll, you'll see that labeled. The things on the right side are non-metals, and there are very few non-metals compared to metals, which if you go back to the periodic table section and you look at the legend that has kind of like other non-metals, you'll see that most of the things labeled are metals, right? We had alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, a section we didn't talk about, but the big one in the middle is transition metals, and then the lanthanoids and actinoids are also metals, tons of metals in the periodic table. What happens here is that you get electron transfer, but then once you have electron transfer, you have a cation and an anion, and what we know from what feels like maybe too long ago at this point is that if you have a positive and a negative charge, those two things are attracted to each other. So the bond is an electrostatic attraction between the positive and negative charges. So in sodium chloride, sodium becomes a cation, so the one plus charge, by giving its electron to chlorine, which becomes the Cl minus anion. And then we have an attraction between those two charges. Now, because this attraction occurs in 3D, so in all three dimensions, ionic compounds will form these kind of lattice structures. So, right, I'm not gonna ask you to draw a lattice structure or anything like that, but it, it becomes an important part of how ionic compounds behave. So you should know that this happens. So, so one sodium at ion will attract chlorines all the way around it and one chlorine ion will attract sodiums all the way around it. And so you just end up building out this lattice. What that means is that if I take a piece of sodium chloride, if I, it's really a bunch of sodiums and a bunch of chlorides all connected to each other. The NaCl is called the formula unit. So when we have an ionic compound, if you hear something referred to as a formula unit, it's the smallest electrically neutral unit in an ionic compound. In the example of calcium chloride, calcium likes to form plus two cations. And just to connect this back to our periodic properties, everything else in the same group as calcium likes to form plus two cations. That doesn't change what chlorine does. Chlorine still likes to form minus one anions, so if I wanna put these together in a way that makes an electrically neutral formula unit, I have to use two chlorines for one calcium. So CaCl2 is the formula unit for calcium chloride. A covalent bond exists between a non-metal and a non-metal. So just things on the right side of the periodic table. And in a covalent bond, the electrons are shared and these compounds exist as discrete molecules. So not a lattice, but in carbon dioxide, so CO2, I have individual CO2 molecules in that sample.
you will also encounter polyatomic ions. These are widely prevalent. So they, they exist all over the place and will be in so many of the compounds that we deal with. What a polyatomic ion is, is it's something that's held together with covalent bonds. So within that polyatomic ion, those atoms are held together with covalent bonds, but it has an overall charge. So as a whole, it can be attracted to cations or anions, depending on the charge in that polyatomic ion, and form an ionic bond. So bleach is a good example of this, and bleach is sodium hypochlorite, which is made up of a sodium one plus cation and this hypochlorite anion, which is ClO minus. So sodium hypochlorite, NaClO, is an ionic compound. The ionic bond is between sodium and the polyatomic anion hypochlorite. Within the polyatomic anion, the chlorine and oxygen are covalently bonded to each other. This affects how naming and formulas are done. And naming is so, it's so important. It's how we communicate about chemical contents. So, right, I've got an example here of sodium hydrogen carbonate, which is also sometimes called sodium bicarbonate because of course we have to have modern names and historical names. And, right, I can type that out really easily or I could write a formula, but they both mean the same thing which is that I have a sodium cation and a bicarbonate, or you might call it hydrogen carbonate, I'm fine with either, and polyatomic anion that is in that molecule. So the best way to work on naming is to practice. It just takes a lot of practice. There is an entire worksheet, and we're going to do a ton of examples with this. So check out the worksheet and check out, I'm sure I'll make some example videos. And if there are no example videos, we will do a ton together in class.